Do you find that you or your child lack resilience? Do you or your child struggle with self-regulation when faced with disappointment or failure? Are you equipped with the skills to teach yourself or your child how to handle these challenging moments? And can you think of any times when you've needed the skills to help someone self-regulate or deal with failure? Today, we're going to continue looking at these critical questions and explore practical strategies to foster resilience and emotional strength. I'm Kate Mason, and welcome to Parenting and Personalities. This is the podcast that connects you with the ones you care about the most. Hi, Tanya. Welcome back. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how we can build resilience, not in our children, not just in our children, rather, but in ourselves as well. Now, we all struggle with that fear of failure and imperfection, and particularly the generation that is coming through. So we're going to talk about the other two pillars of resilience that you discuss in your parenting handbook. Now, I'm just wondering, is this a Western society it's issue it's or is it worldwide? So... I think, Kate, within Western societies, we've really put a focus on protecting our kids, on taking away play, taking away risk. Whereas I do think within other cultures in the world, there's still a very, very strong focus on family. There's a strong focus on play. Our kids are not overscheduled. They are still allowed to experience failure. So all of that cotton wool, all of that protection that we're putting around our children is definitely cultural. Um, For instance, in our book, we talk about kids in Denmark. Yeah. So can you tell us about that? Because Finland also is another area of the schooling system that is renowned and there's scholars, they do so well, and yet none of our teaching practices have embraced what they do and they allow their children to do skills, work Absolutely. on skills, life skills at school, you know, um, you know, and they allow them to fail as well and they're outside and they are playing. I, I agree with you, play is just so, so important. Yeah. So can you tell us about? Yes. So the kids in Denmark, what we see from them, um, and really they've been voted the happiest children in the world. Wow. What happens with these kiddos is that a large part of their day, they have school, but it's only for four or five hours a day. But And then the rest of the day, and even within the school day, there's lots and lots of space for play. Kids go out onto the playground. There's lots of space for imagination, for curiosity. They want to climb a tree. They can climb a tree. Unlike here in North America, and you can tell me about Australia in a minute, play has not become completely sanitized, where all risk has been taken away from our kids. A lot of the kids here, Kate, the, the numbers are horrifying. A lot of the kids here don't even play anymore. So basically, free time has become screen time. So we don't see kids exploring, mm-hmm. being outside. Mixed age groups, when it comes to play with kids, is fantastic. So having a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. Yeah beautiful and without having an adult hovering nearby so here a lot of the time there's an adult constantly coordinating the play what needs to happen with these kids what we need and what's happening with the kids in Denmark is there's lots of space for play and for risk and for independent play importantly and what we're seeing here is that all of those things are being stripped away from our kids Absolutely. So our playgrounds are so sanitized that no one can fall. There's nothing fun, nothing fast. They're all colored. They're all, there's no natural stuff in that. And also the fact, uh, <laughs> here's me, watch out, don't fall. Um, I've changed my whole language around, you know, with hang on tight, you're doing a good job, watch where you put your hands, that type of thing. So the scare, we scare our children around play a lot as well you know always monitoring and and the other thing with play is like you say parents infiltrate what goes on between children they don't allow them to solve their own playtime problems and that goes all the way through school I just spoke to a woman the other day who said that 
her child was 11, the friendship group had split up and even though she attempted to talk to one of these friends, they kind of snubbed her and she said, oh, should I go and talk to her mum or, or talk to the teacher? And I said to her, look, how about sitting down with her and talking about friendship itself and how, you know, there are some friendships that last forever and some friendships don't and some friendships renew, you know, like it's, perhaps there are other people around that she might be able to be better friends with because all of a sudden we're in, you know, she's in protection mode. Now once you would, you take that out of their hands. You know, we as parents take the problem solving because that's where the playground is. It's where you have your fight with your friend and you push them over or you do whatever and then the problem solved. Now if it turns to be aggressive, I guess perhaps the stepping in and probably the sensible reasoning around that and, you know, how you deal with conflict, which is different. But, yeah, I, I think we've taken – it all away from them. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, a couple of things. So one, when we're looking at independent play, this is where kids dig deep, where they have to go, who am I? How do I have my voice heard right now? How do I solve this conflict? How do we negotiate? Who's playing what if they're playing an imaginary game? What are the rules of game going to be? All of those things happen so beautifully when kids are allowed to play independently with an, without an adult coming in and going, these are the rules. This is your role. Okay, you two are fighting. This is what's going to happen. You go for a timeout. You can keep playing with your friends. When do kids ever have the space to really nurture all of those executive functioning skills, which is problem solving, perspective taking, judgment? All of those things are basically eradicated from their daily interactions. And that, I would argue, is just as important, if not more important, than a lot of the kind of more structured activities that we tend to almost push down our children's throats. Mm -hmm. So so much, be so many beautiful things happen within groups of um, children playing. And then the other one that you'd mentioned, Kate, when you're saying, you know, you have to really watch about, be careful, or watch where you're putting your foot. When we think about a child who is mastering the monkey bars and they're going from monkey bar to monkey bar and we're kind of maybe are sitting back going, you know, we're, we're kind of smiling, but inside we're going, oh my goodness, <laughs> he is going to fall. This is a, a broken arm yeah. about to happen. <laughs> but as they do those monkey bars, they have these little jolts of adrenaline, which goes, can I do this or can't I do this? And when they're actually able to get through those monkey bars, they go, oh, I can. I am a competent person. Competency is the base of healthy self-esteem. We spoke about that in a previous episode. So those little skills that so often we cast aside and go, oh, no, they, we need to put them in extra soccer, extra swimming, extra tutoring. Slow down and ask yourself, what does my child actually get when I give them space to play and to be? Because there's so much beauty that lies within those moments for our children. Oh, there is. There is. And it's like you say too with the television time, um, TV before school or or games before school, games after school, and then everyone says, the boy, you know, these boys are ADHD. And I was talking to um, uh, one of my son's friends the other day and he said every morning when I'd get up, I would go outside and I'd bounce a ball and I'd hit a ball against a wall for an hour before school. And then after school, we would go and ride our bikes down the street. This is the old world, you know, and no one was worried about whether I'd be kidnapped. I mean, the amount of kidnappings that happen are very rare in comparison with how worried we are about letting our children get outside and be more physical and, and have a bit of time where, you know, when you walk down the street by yourself, how brave do you feel too? You know, as a child, when you've got that independence and mum did let you go to the shop by yourself, you know, all of those things are resilience building. You can give them the skills to do it. You can say, if these things happen, just be aware. But it does, you know, it's it's such a different thing and we really need to let our kids play and we really need to be turning off televisions and totally. and that's another whole story over the other side but yeah absolutely yeah. um jonathan high too wrote um the anxious generation it's amazing he says mm -hmm. that we're overprotecting our children in the real world and underprotecting them online and so we're so worried yes. what happens if they go outside what happens if um they fall or if they're kidnapped we always all have these huge fears for our kids 
And so we keep them inside on screens. But what we're seeing statistically is that the real danger lies on screens and what's happening on those screens and less so in our real world fears. And I think as parents, because we don't watch often too, parents don't sit next to their child and watch those things either. They don't see what's happening on those screens and that's where more of the predators are than anywhere in the world. Absolutely. Are on the are on those screens as well. And I know that's another su- subject for another time, but if you are a our parent next podcast. listening right now. <laughs> yes, our next one. Let's have a chat. Uh, massive thoughts around that as well. And if so, if you are a parent listening and your child is doing that, it's time to make changes it? and it's time to actually do that now, I think. Absolutely. Because it, it's, it's only going to get worse as well. It's not going to change for that, you know, in that sense. And the other thing about about you we were talking about bluey you and i um just before and i haven't watched those episodes but my husband my sorry brother is a grandfather and he when we talk about um children and 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 learning from things and what they learn episodes like uh, things like bluey are important he said he the other day he um was fixing something and he got really frustrated and he said to her, because he's been watching Bluey as well, he said, well, I'm feeling really angry and frustrated at the moment and this child's two and a half. And she put her hand on him and she said, now, Grandpa, I want you to take a big breath, okay? And he said, he took the big breath and she said to him, now, does that feel better? (laughs) So what an impact, you know, so if that's an impact of a child's show, what an impact does all of that other violence and stuff that our kids are seeing? And if you can impact your child in a positive way, that is the way that we want the world to go, isn't it? It's beautiful. And really, Kate, what you're talking about there, we call it digital veggies versus digital candy. Okay. <laughs> so really in this instance, your beautiful example, Bluey is a digital veggie because our kids are learning, there's values, it's a slower mm-hmm. show, there's not so many images. Um, it's beautiful. There's lots that happens in a show like Bluey. Yes. Whereas our yes. digital candy is ah, it's scrolling, yes. it's kind of candy crush type games where really it keeps our kids' attention, but there's no development. So mm. I love just that reminder and your reminder there that we're not saying that all tech is bad. We're saying that it's really important to be aware of what sort of tech your child is spending time on. And we really want a heavy portion of digital veggies for our children. Yes, I love that. And candy, you can't stop eating, can you? Absolutely. You know, that's Absolutely. the problem. Absolutely. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. It's, it's Moorish, mm. as, we, as we all know. But it's a great It's a great title. It's a great thing to have on there because it's very relatable too, isn't it? Yeah. Now, when we t- write on stories right now, Let's talk about the day. Is it the Danish stories that are Hans Christian Andersen? Yes, yes. Let's just have a quick chat about that. Yes. So, in our conversations together, Kate, we've been talking about how we really have moved towards bubble wrapping our kids and protecting them. Nobody fails. Everything has a happy ending. Um, Everything has this glow to it, but it's very surface level. There's not enough depth to what our kids are being exposed to. So when we look at the Hans Christensen, Christensen Anderson, did I say that right? Yes. Yes. Hans Christian, yep. Yes. When <laughs> okay. we when we look at those fairy tales, our traditional fairy tales, they're very dark, but there is beautiful, beautiful storylines, values, morals threaded through those dark stories they don't necessarily have a happy ending but when we read them to our kids it's this beautiful reflection of what life actually is and it allows for these wonderful conversations that can then occur where we can go let's talk about death let's talk about grief let's talk about loss let's talk about an unpredictable world and with the danish part of their parenting is that we don't protect our kids that we do allow them to be exposed to particularly here in the case of fairy tales different types Mm -hmm. of stories where they can go what does that mean mom or oh that's interesting that kind of scares me let's talk about that scared feeling for you what does that look like what does that mean who can you go to when you feel those feelings we can actually have those 
conversations and those discussions. So a beautiful part of the Danish philosophy is, again, so we've said lots of independence, play, less structure, making sure that kids have a wide array of messages from their world, including fairy tales and authenticity. So we don't always have to have a little happy ending. We can actually expose our kids to life, really. And that is such a great story too. And it's guided. If you're guiding your child while you're reading, then you can guide that conversation as well. You know, you can support them through what might be sadness because I agree. Look, honestly, the fairy tales that we had when we were a child, you know, Hats and Gretel. You know, <laughs> totally horrifying. Didn't, psychologi- <laughs> didn't psychologically damage us. We just thought we'd never hang out with witches. Absolutely. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> seriously, you know, and all of that has just been taken out. Everything is so clean and, like you say, sanitized in the library. It's there's, There is nothing. So to listener listening to us right now, Go out and have a look, Hans Christian Andersen's. I I remember Thumbelina. You yes. know all of oh, their things yes. from my childhood. Absolutely. Oh, just uh, yes, yeah. amazing. And they were just they were just so, a part of childhood. I remember hearing those stories, and I would think about them, and I would want them read to me again, and reread, and yes. reread, and yep. reread. And for many of our kids nowadays, it's just not there anymore. Mm. Another big another big part of Danish parenting is togetherness. So. Um, the Danish make sure that there is always a time where the family comes together, where there's warmth. So they've got candles. We might read books together. We're going to play board games together. And we, we just spend time together. So I think that when we expose our kids to the world, to life, to different endings and stories, I think that there's also it's important that our kids have a place where they can anchor in belonging. And I think the Danes do that beautifully. Yes. So belonging is second pillar. Belonging is Is a second pillar. It is. So in that belonging with young parents, the Instagram parents of today, you know, things are going so fast and they don't, to me, appear to have any time to sit in anything and be with their child and, I worked in an early learning centre um, and the minute the child came up to the parent at the end of the day, they were so busy talking to another parent that they would just handball them their iPhone, their electronics, whatever. And at home, things are just too busy because your home has to look perfect. You know, these parents are suffering. I, I hear my daughter talk and I say to her, does it matter how you appear to, the, to people like that? Do you know them? Are they really part of your friendship? Why is that important? You know, like, but it is, you know, it's become important. And so those together times, I don't imagine happen as often. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say here as a person with adult children, it's hard. It's hard to have that together time. And we did it at dinner. And I used to, we have had dinner together forever. And I know that's part of your belonging thing. And they were so frustrating and it was annoying. And I would sit and tell them table manners and, you know, when they were teenagers, they'd storm off from the table. And every time we sat at dinner again, my husband would say to me, why are we doing this? And I say, because this is the time we come together. As young adults, if I mentioned to them that we might just have dinner on our laps or something, they'd go, no, 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 we sit at the table. That's where we sit. And we all sit now and we sit for a couple of hours Mm -hmm. over dinner. Mm -hmm. So creating those times you're talking about are so, so important. Absolutely. And Kate, really what you're saying there with adult children, your adult children are saying, this is what we do. This is who we are. This is our ritual. That's what we get to next. Yes. Yes. We sit at the table together. And, you know, until I started – creating more presentations, workshops before I researched this book. I had no idea that there was so much research on family dinners. I knew. I knew that it's, I know that it's good for you. I've always been told that, you know, turn the TV off, sit down, have family dinner. Uh, but it wasn't until I, until I started looking 
that I really began to realize the profound, profound impact that family dinner has on kids. It's incredible. It's all sorts of things. It makes them less at risk for um, risky behaviors. It's a protector against anxiety and depression. It increases their vocabulary exponentially. It creates a stronger sense of belonging within families. It goes on and on and on, protects them against eating disorders. Just wonderful things. It also culturally teaches them manners too, how to behave at a table. Absolutely. How to, you know, when you go to someone else's house, you know, how to eat, how to, you know, just a whole lot of culturally acceptable stuff as well. Absolutely. I mean, that used to be my main battle. Yeah. Jack, don't talk with your mouth full. Jack, don't talk with your mouth full. Watch your elbows. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and he'll say to me, even now if he sits at the table and I say something, he says, Mum. I don't do this at anyone else's table, I say to him, but I don't want to see it at mine either. Like we have this running joke around it. But it does create humour and it is the place where you can have those conversations. Absolutely. And the tough conversations. And it is the place where, like I say, Paul and I, we spoke, we have businesses and we've spoken about our failures mm-hmm. and we had discussions with them about what to do with their lives and yeah. what was happening. So important. Yeah. And if you don't do it at the dinner table, when do we do it? Yeah. We know the two times that we're most likely to connect with the kid uh, is family meals, if we do family meals. And it doesn't have to be dinner, by the way. So we now know that it's just family meals. So it can be lunch, breakfast, dinner, but it's family meals and it's in the car. Those are the two places we're most likely to connect. Is yeah. that true? <laughs> it's true. Because <laughs> I was just about to say, <laughs> if you were able to travel a distance with your child in the car with no headphones. See, I didn't have headphones either, mm-hmm. but we live 15 minutes from school. And it was in that time that I got more out of my children or than, than I got at any other time in the day because once they get home, they throw their bags down and they're off. Yep. But it was so valuable. And I always say to parents now, if you cannot have headphones in the car, you get the most wonderful conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think when there's hard things to talk about with kids too, there's something very special about being in the car because you're not sitting opposite each other. So it's not as confront- confrontational as that eye-to-eye contact. You know, we can just say like, it's been a really hard week, hasn't it, while we're driving? And then wait, see what they do with it. Um, it's the same with walking. If you go for a walk with your kiddo, take the headphones out it's also a beautiful place if there's something that you want to bring up when we aren't um sitting across from them we tend to get more when we're alongside them which happens in the car and happens on walks very very true very true and once again a really worthwhile thing doing I don't know, with sullen teenagers getting headphones out of their ears <laughs> do that. So best to start young. Totally, totally, totally. <laughs> Get it in as early as you can, you know, because it is. So so we're talking about, um, it was boundary. No, what was Belonging, our, belonging. Our second one is belonging. So feeling connected and, and belonging. So can you tell me about unconditional love Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so unconditional love is such a beautiful question unconditional love is our children knowing that nothing can ever separate them from our love there's nothing that they can do or say that would make us feel differently about them there it's a it's a place where i love to think of it and i believe that it was dr gordon newfeld said this but it's where they can rest in our love Yes, it's a lovely thought. That's a lovely. It really is. It's so it's so it's calming, and you know we can still put in boundaries. We can still do consequences if they are needed. I think sometimes when we talk about gentle parenting, there's a confusion that gentle parenting means permissive parenting. It doesn't. They're two completely different things. But I think when our kids are struggling, when they go through life's hard moments, if we can let them rest in our love they're more likely to be able to bring that stress response down and then go exactly what we said earlier with resiliency and then say, okay, so how do I want to handle what happened on Instagram today? Or what do I want to do about that teacher? It's very hard for our kids to grow when they don't feel safe. And I know for my girls, I always want to be their safe harbor during a storm. And that doesn't suddenly happen when they're 25. That happens when they're five, when they're 10, when they're 15, when they go, ah, I just had these really big feelings. Maybe mom had to put a limit in with me, but I had these big feelings, but she's still there. 
She's always there. And that's who I want to be as a mom for my girls. Yep. 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 It makes such sense. And if you do say something in the moment, because, you know, sometimes that does happen and you might say something, then always telling them about your mistakes. Absolutely. And talking it through and, you know, because those things happen in life. We're never going to be like no. perfect, like you say. No. You know. Yeah, and I think that that ability, Kate, to come back and go, um, I'm sorry, when mom speaks in that tone, it scares you and that's not okay. And then stopping at that because I think so often the way we apologize to kids is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have spoken that way. It's just you've been so sassy all day and I just like I just reached my limit, which isn't an apology at all. No. It's so interesting. We expect so much from our kids when it comes to emotion regulation, to being able to repair. But yet, as adults, we often have a very, very hard time with emotion regulation and also with repair. Very different standards for our children. We do. And, but we didn't know about emotional regulation, <laughs> you know. We blame our parents. Knowing, <laughs> yes, 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 it was their fault. But I, but I, but I think that also part of my personality stuff is there are parents that are much more emotionally regulated naturally, mm-hmm. genetically, mm-hmm. Um, than there are, you know, my husband isn't emotionally regulated as naturally as I am mm-hmm. as a person. Absolutely. Um, in that sense. So I think... For for some people, it's actually easier to do this stuff. I would agree. You know, you, you you're not. Some people are much more explosive. Um. So yes, I think recognizing and understanding. This is where recognizing and understanding yourself, and who you are, and where those emotions come from, and also your way of venting emotions is really important for you and your child to understand. Look, Dad's a little bit more emotional. He will blow up every now and then. You know, like mm-hmm. he's tr- trying to regulate, but doesn't always happen. So they also understand your you as a parent. Absolutely, absolutely. And and again, as you and I have said previously, it's it's them understanding that we're all growing. It's all a journey. So maybe Dad's hopefully working on his reactivity, um, but we're growing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> So tell us about hope. Mm-hmm. So, you know, hope is an, an interesting one. And I, I was very careful when writing the section on hope because I think so often we're kind of sold this pop mental health and wellness psychology. Like, yes. um, you know, uh, talk to somebody, reach out if you're having issues. Um, you always have a friend in me. Um if you like this post, get get somebody to like this post. If you oh like this, if you care about me, like this post. Like, it's all very quick and bubbly, and there's there's some good messages in there. Don't get me wrong, but that's not actually how we help our kids to know you've got somebody by your side. And so I often say to teachers when I talk to teachers, it's not about the motivational posters on your walls in a classroom. Like to me, when a kid is going through a crisis, those posters actually mean nothing. Those posters are more for decoration than anything else. Hope is a child going or a teen going, when I feel unanchored, who do I talk to? Who really cares about me? Is it my therapist? Is it mom? Is it dad? Is it my auntie? At school when I'm struggling, what actually happens? What does the principal actually do? What does the teacher actually do? Does does a teacher actually know me beyond being a behavior? Does he actually know me? Does she actually know me? And to me, that's hope is how do we know our children deeply? And I'm not saying that every principal is going to know a child deeply, But do they care? Do they care deeply? And the way kids know if we care deeply is through our actions. It's through concrete actions where it's, you know, getting down on their level and going, hey, I missed you yesterday. You weren't at school. You okay? That is hope right there. Right, right. So how do we foster hope Mm -hmm. in our children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the big big thing um, in fostering hope is to stop talking to listen deeply. I think um, 
you know, as a culture, we often don't listen very deeply. So to really try and understand their perspective without jumping in too quickly to go, okay, what is the feeling underneath what they're saying right now? What do they need? And sometimes they may just need us to bring them a hot chocolate. Sometimes they may just need us to watch a movie with them. No wise words necessarily, but just knowing that somebody is there. So I think the key here is to slow down, stop talking, be curious. We can be silently curious, but be curious about what might actually be happening. Listen deeply and then with your actions, start to build that fort around the child that is struggling. And then know too that sometimes we may need to actually throw the lifeboat out and get extra help. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. What What's one question you would ask them when they finish speaking? Um, because what we do as parents and yeah. people is we come in and rescue mm -hmm. and solve and problem solve. So Absolutely. what would be the non-problem solving Beautiful. question? Beautiful. Great question. So let's just say, let's say that they're, they're crying. They feel all alone at school. Um, you know, their, their friends have blocked them on social media, whatever it might have, or whatever it might be. I want us to listen all the way through. Kids are going to be different. So either we're going to take a minute and just go, it's really hard when we feel all alone. Just wait. Just wait. We don't have to do anything beyond that. Because when we do that, we're with them in that moment. We don't need to go like, okay, what are we going to do? Let's let's get your, let's make a list of all the people who love you and we're going to call all those friends from the neighborhood. You know, maybe, maybe next week sometime, we might go like, hey, I wonder if maybe we could just organize a sleepover here at our house with the neighbor friend. You know, we, we might do something like that later on. But in the moment with our kid, they just need us to be with them. They just need us to hear them. So we could do something like that. And then there are other kids, like one of my little girls. Um, she's very intuitive. She doesn't like it when I name her feelings. Um, and... All she needs from me is to be with her when she's really upset, when she's having those big feelings. And when she's ready, either give her a hug or make her a cup of tea or get her a snack. But she just needs me to co-regulate with her. She doesn't want me to name feelings with her. And to a degree, I guess some children, it's like when I, with my daughter and sometimes I'll you know, say, listen, you know, how can I help you um, type of thing? And she said, don't use that talk with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, look, you know, I'm just trying to do my best. Totally, here. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. So, so my little Una, she will say to me, um, so if I say to her, I mean, she's eight, so she's not yes. having kind of the big, the big feel, well, the rejection feelings yet that yes. we were just speaking about, but she'll, if she's having feelings, I'll say to her, <sighs> you sound so sad right now. And she'll say, don't use validation on me. Um, psychologist kid, right? Like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> don't use that technique on me. <laughs> so I've learned, just You're don't say anything. Think something else. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Good idea. Good idea. And and look, I only read the book, How to Talk So Your Kids Will Listen or How to Listen yes, to Your Kids Will Talk and about. Yes, Julianne. Oh, I read that three years ago and, can I tell you that listening school I learned from that, which is just what you're talking about right now, Yeah, was one of the most valuable things. I, I'm 62 and I learned it too late. Okay? <laughs> so, I, you know, the, the I try and use that every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and I've told my husband to use it and he was really, really good in one situation that we had. And I just said to him just three words, listen, listen, listen. And he was, he was like, oh, we just want to say something. I could see him squirming. Um, but he listened and it was the best result for that conversation. And we're problem solvers. Yep. We like to help someone. We like to solve their problem. Yeah. And the biggest thing is that that's the least important thing when you have that conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, Kate, when, when we can, when we listen, we're more likely to actually get to the emotion that's underneath. Um, 
I'll, I'll give you a quick little story with one of my foster boys. Um, he was really upset one day and he was destroying his whole bedroom. So there was holes in the wall, the posters had come down and he was busy pouring a jug of water down the air vent. And I was in the room, but I was away from him. Um, I think both safety for both of us. I was away from yes. him. And I looked at him at one point and this is one of the times I got it right. I didn't always get it right, but I looked at him and yeah, I said, yeah. you're so sad. And he, he kind of stopped in his tracks and he looked at me and he went from this full rage into tears. He just burst into mm-hmm. tears. And it was just this beautiful moment where I was like, it was my heart touching his heart instead uh-huh. of me coming in with lots of words. And you know, with other kids, we'd probably put in a limit, put in a boundary. It's a little bit bigger. So we're just keeping everybody safe at this point. But I think for parents to remember, slow down, be quiet, and really try and connect with your heart with them in those moments. Yeah, That is really beautiful. And we'll leave it on that beautiful note. Tanya, thank you. You have incredible expertise and knowledge, and I've I'm continually learning. I don't think we ever stop learning. And I think that if you listen, yeah, well, you are listening today. Of course you are. Um, but for the listener, remember, we can go on learning. Learning is, you know, once you stop learning, you're dead, I think. <laughs> you know, we can learn every day of our lives. So thank you once again for joining me today. I'm so lucky to have you here. Well, um, your insights are amazing. Oh, it was my absolute pleasure. Such a treat, Kate. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we'll talk again, I hope. <laughs> that was wonderful, Kate. Thank you. As we conclude today's episode, it's important to reflect on the values that failure and imperfection bring to our lives. Embracing these challenges is essential not only for personal growth, but also for teaching our children how to navigate life's ups and downs with resilience and grace. Understanding and accepting that life won't always be perfect is crucial in developing the strength to handle the adversity. Here are three benefits of embracing failure and imperfection. Number one, failure is the greatest teacher. It provides invaluable lessons that success simply cannot. When we encounter setbacks, we're forced to reevaluate, adapt, and find new solutions. This process fosters creativity problem-solving skills, and deeper understanding of ourselves and capabilities. Teaching our children to see failure as a learning opportunity helps them to develop a growth mindset where they can understand that their abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work. Number two, handling failure builds resilience, the ability to bounce back from difficulties. Life is unpredictable and being able to change and adapt is a crucial skill. Number three, Experiencing failure and imperfection helps us develop empathy and compassion for others who are going through similar struggles. It fosters a shared sense of humanity and understanding that everyone faces challenges. Now this awareness can strengthen our relationships and create a supportive environment where we and our children feel safe to express vulnerabilities and seek help when needed. By embracing the imperfections and failures of life, we equip ourselves and our children with the tools that are needed to navigate the ever-changing world we're in with confidence and resilience. Thank you for listening to Parenting and Personalities. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you could leave a rating and a review that would help others learn about this podcast. If you're interested in discovering more about you and your family's personality types, you'll find my book, Who Is This Monster or Treasure My House, on Booktopia or Amazon. If you have an episode idea, please send a note to thepersonalitycoach at gmail.com. Many thanks to our producers at Stories and Strategies, and we'll see you next time.